Welcome to Living Legacy Leadership, where we explore, discover, and share insights, tools, and strategies for a life well-lived into elderhood. I'm your host, Donna Kim Brand, author, speaker, legacy strategy coach, and creator of the concept Living Legacy, where you choose to live life on your own terms while contributing to people, places, and projects along your life journey. I believe that the life you live is the legacy you leave. Now, the guests I bring to you each week all address some unique aspect of learning, leadership, or legacy. This helps you raise your own game as a leader in business and life, and also showcases some extraordinary people who exemplify living legacy leadership. At least once a month, I also offer a training session to skill you in game-changer thinking for your own application. So get your notebook ready or sharpen up your memory by tuning in your attention, and we'll dive right in. I'm totally enthralled and delighted to bring to you, again, uh, a dear friend and someone that uh, you will feel familiar with yourself in uh, other ways, Mr. Arun Gandhi. So welcome, Arun. Thank you. Pleasure to be on your show. Well, thank you. So we know you've come a long way from being born in South Africa in the 1930s. And um, in those days, you, under under the rule or law of apartheid, I understand you were bullied and beaten by the whites for appearing to be too dark and by the South African blacks for appearing to be too white. And this led you to be a kind of troubled young man that played out later in your life as you spent time with your, your grandfather, the, uh, you know, that we all know as Mahatma Gandhi. Um, mm. Tell us a little bit about that, you know, what it was like as a kid when you went to visit him in India and uh, there were so many demands on his time from other people and you were just a kid coming from another country. Yeah, it was very uh, strange, and especially, you know, because the early part of my life, as you said, I grew up with apartheid and all that hate and prejudice, and I guess uh, people are made differently because I see a lot of the people, a lot of my friends who grew up with me at the same time, they kind of uh, accepted that hate and prejudice without... uh, you know, squirming about it or or uh, not being affected by it in any way. And uh, they just kind of let it pass. And I was one that couldn't do that. I think I was too sensitive and, uh, and I couldn't get over it. And so uh, it affected me in the sense that I, I became angry, frustrated, uh, disappointed, and... Um, you know, and just wanted, I wanted to fight back again and uh, get revenge for all the uh, torment that I was being put through. And that's when my parents uh, decided it was time to go to India and, and leave me with grandfather and hopefully that I would learn something from him. Uh, I, I, as you rightly said, he was a very busy man at the time and uh, involved with many things uh, happening. And the struggle for freedom was coming to a boil and uh, freedom was likely to uh, happen in in a year or two. So, you know, there were lots of things were churning up at the time and uh, and he was very busy. So... I didn't expect that he would be able to give me so much time with him, but um, he he did. He he found uh, one hour every day uh, to devote to me, and and, uh, that one hour was mine, and nothing could deter him or uh, anybody uh, from taking that hour away, and and so during that hour, he uh, was just a grandfather to me. And, uh, you know, like most grandfathers, he would tell me stories or you know, would ask me about my lessons, if I had any difficulties uh, and wanted any help with that and so on. 
And also on occasions, he told me, uh, you know, taught me lessons about various things in life. Uh, but he had a knack of teaching. He didn't just made you sit and and uh, you know listen to a lecture. Uh, he would use an, a situation that happened during the day uh, in, in which you were involved and use that occasion to turn it into a lesson. And so, uh, you know, you were able to um, anchor that lesson in your mind and, and uh, not let it slip away. And uh, so, you know, all those lessons lived with me and I grew up and began reflecting on them and I realized how important they were and how life-changing they were. Mm, amazing. You know, I think because we, you know, most of humanity knows of um, Mahatma, even you, from the point of, of fame and successes based on the movement and the, the issues you've worked on. But um, neither of you sort of, you know, starting with him, were born into that. It was something that, that developed because of the leadership role he took in the um, mm. movement and so on. So my question to you is, as you grew up, having had this exposure to him as a kid and then juxtaposed it with the kind of upbringing you had in South Africa, how, how did you ever feel like pressured? to take on the Gandhi legend, the Gandhi causes? Um, how did you make your own way with such a profound legacy um, right in front of you? Well, one thing I can say that uh, in our family, I don't remember anybody pressuring anybody to do what uh, uh, people expected them to do. Um, you know, my father's generation, for instance, nobody pressured the four boys uh, to do uh, or follow grandfather's footsteps or anything. But uh, they felt from inside, you know, the need to, um, to follow him and to participate in the struggle and, and to go to prisons. And, and so they did it themselves. And in my case also, I can say my parents never pressured me uh, that you have a legacy and you have to live up to it and, and do all these things. Uh, they never did that. But I saw them uh, doing, you know, uh, all these things for the poor people. And, and take, you know, I, I remember as a little kid when I was growing up that my parents uh, would do all kinds of little things to help the poor people around us. Uh, for instance, my mom used to collect uh, um, clothes uh, still in good shape from her friends in town, bring it home, wash them, clean them, iron them, and uh, hang them up in, a, in what she called was her store in a room. And the poor Africans would come there and, and uh, pick the clothes and, and take whatever they wanted. And, and there was a price tag for all of that, you know, a very ridiculous price tag, one penny or two pennies. For, uh, so one day I asked my mom, I said, why do you put this price tag? It doesn't help anybody. It, it doesn't cost the, uh, I mean, it doesn't cover the cost of the article itself. And she said, no, it's uh, to honor them. Uh, you know, just because they are poor, that doesn't mean that we have to give them um, uh, gifts and, and hand downs. Uh, they, they feel the pride of having bought the stuff for themselves. And so it's building that pride in the poor people. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a very profound lesson. You know, we have this habit. Uh, we see a poor person and we just hand over some money or some food to the person and walk away that we have done our uh, duty. But what we have done is made that person more dependent on charity. 
we have oppressed that person just as much as uh, you know poverty oppresses the person uh, we have just added on to that poverty by making that person dependent and the purpose of helping poor people or anybody who is in oppression is not to make them dependent but to rebuild their self respect and self confidence and make them uh, you know worthy contributing citizens and, and so that's what they were doing and I, that was a profound lesson for me mm. uh, not at that moment i mean it didn't you know i didn't think about it that when i was 10 12 years old but when i grew up and i realized uh, you know when i got involved uh, in work i i realized the wisdom of uh, such lessons and so yeah it's uh, you know we just kind of naturally i mean if you ask me now what was the time in your life when you uh, it was a eureka moment when you woke up and said you are going to do this there isn't any moment like that it just kind of uh, happened and and gradually i found myself getting more and more involved in uh, in all of these things mm. so it, I, there was no pressure from anybody hmm. so i understand that um when you got married to an indian woman sonanda lovely mm. lady mm. the honor of being her gosh it was almost 30 years ago now when we first met <laughs> um <laughs> and it you know i know that she was a big part of the projects you did together rescuing orphan kids from the streets and putting in in homes starting the gandhi uh worldwide education institute the gandhi institute for nonviolence so mm. was it important for you um to have a partner in your wife who had the same sort of ethic uh yeah it was important because uh, i was in that uh, you know uh, uh, mindset uh, of helping the poor i wasn't so much interested in uh, in luxuries or making a life for myself and amassing wealth and all that uh, so it was important that i had somebody who shared that vision with me mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and she did and uh, so we became a good uh, couple and and at the time before our marriage we discussed all this and i told her i said uh, you know this is what i feel like and that is what i feel life is meant to be uh, that we don't uh, chase after money and and uh, so on and uh, and be satisfied with uh, what little we can earn and devote the rest of our time and energy to helping other people and she agreed with that and so it worked out well otherwise mm-hmm. you know both of us would have been involved in work and and uh, chasing after more and more money and uh, and you know this uh, being more selfish and, and self-centered and that's not what i thought life was meant to be Mm. Well, yeah, but having said that, I I've sometimes encountered people who come from a legacy or they come from a family that might have fame or fortune and then the the public assume you have all the fortune or even fame you need to get your programs off the ground and survive and sustain your work. How do you handle mm. that in terms of getting support? which frankly seems like you've pretty much done on your own um with the help of partners you found it wasn't handed to well, you on a plate that, yeah that's uh, that's been always a, a big challenge and you know we uh, human beings we have learned to uh, to judge everything by